Well, good afternoon, everyone. Sound check, you can hear me in the back. I feel like I'm at a Metallica concert here with that's like standing room only. This is great. And I apologize to those of you who were born after 1985 for me to understand the Metallica reference. So. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Willoughby, and I'm the Dean of the Edwards School of Business, professor in the Department of Finance and Management Science. As we gather here today, we acknowledge that we are meeting on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. I pay a sincere respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place. And especially, I cherish and respect individuals who cherish the land for generations so that my ancestors, who are from the Ukraine, uh, from Norway, and from the British Isles, could, could make a living on the land in Saskatchewan and in Manitoba. As a non-Indigenous man, I commit, as part of my act towards reconciliation, to listen and learn how I can better be an ally in this tremendous, tremendous effort. I acknowledge that there's an opportunity of reconciliation for us as a community and as a society, and I am grateful to be here in this wonderful opportunity today in person so we can meet for this tremendously important event. I welcome everyone to the Edwards School of Business and especially welcome you to the 16th, let me say that again, 16th presentation in the Gordon and Maureen Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. This is an amazing, amazing event annually that we have in the Edwards School of Business. Entrepreneurs find solutions to problems. We have found a solution, finally, after the years I've been serving as dean, every time in January, it was always like 35 below, this year, we've cracked the code. It's wonderfully great weather outside. It's not minus 35. And I am grateful to be here today to welcome you to an in-person, three-dimensional Haddock event. And a special welcome to all those of you who are visiting from out of town. Just show of hands, who's not here from Sa Who here is not from Saskatoon? So, whoa. So thank you for bringing the population of Swift Current with us today. A special welcome to the future entrepreneurs who are here today as part of the Get a, uh, Get a Bigger Wagon event, to their family members who are joining them today. I proudly wear this bracelet that was given to me years ago by a young aspiring entrepreneur. It's me been a real symbol of the great um, and tremendous successes that are created by entrepreneurs past, present, and future. This afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing Gordon and Maureen Haddock. Gordon and Maureen are great friends of the Edwards School of Business, both alumni at the University of Saskatchewan. Gordon graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce degree. Maureen is a graduate of the College of Education. The Haddocks give of themselves. Um, they give of their time, give of their talent. They are true entrepreneurs. And having them develop the Gordon and Maureen Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series is a tremendously fitting accomplishment for their lifetime of of success and achievement in this area. They began this speaker series in 2007. Now, COVID might have canceled the Junos. COVID might have canceled the Canadian Football League, but COVID never canceled the Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. Even when we had to do in 2020, remember early in 2021, a completely virtual event with a very small number of people there, Haddock's found a way to succeed. That is the success of an entrepreneur. It's been said the best way to predict the future is to create it. And thank you, Haddocks, for helping us to create a better future. Thank you, all of you who are here today as current and future entrepreneurs for what you are doing to create the future that we all need. I'd like now to invite Gordon Haddock to come forward and introduce today's special guest, Ms. Cindy Lowe. Gordon. Yeah, it's almost unnatural to be outside and 13 below because every year it's 35 to 40 and then there's the wind so I don't must be the wind from swift current or something that warm chinook or something that came up and you were talking about the COVID thing we we rented a building I don't know at the exhibition 50,000 square feet and there was about 20 of us so that we could all maintain distance and we had to haul the money in a wagon across the room and not, it was quite a promotion. But uh, anyways, we accomplished it and we never missed one. So, um, you know, it's our 16th annual 
Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. And, and what does that mean? Well, if you want to feel old, the first year students were two years old when we started this. <laughs> the fourth years were just starting grade one. And Dean Willoughby was celebrating the 2007 Saskatchewan Rough Rider Grey Cup victory. As some of you know, and as the Dean has mentioned, I was a commerce grad, and my life partner and business partner, Maureen, was an education grad. And this is an interesting and important combination for two reasons. One, the uh, commerce entrepreneur was always finding and starting new businesses, but these businesses all had team members who needed to be constantly trained, and what better partner to have and uh, is one who had an education degree. So much of our business success over the past 50 years was driven by hundreds of well-trained and motivated team members. Secondly, I was the entrepreneurial gung-ho commerce grad where decisions are simple. They're black or white. And my wife was one of those persons that got me to see uh, both sides of all the different shades of gray. So it's, uh, it slowed me down, let's just say about that, on my decision-making process. Now our guest speaker, Cindy Lowe, is an amazing woman entrepreneur and educator who packs every minute of her long day with action. Not only does she have a commerce degree, but she also has a master's degree in education. She must constantly talk to herself uh, as both sides of her mind analyze every decision she makes. Let's start this. Oh my, but what are the consequences of this? Who cares? Let's get going. But wait, there must be other things we can think of, ramifications, and so on and so on. I don't know how you do it. We do it as a team, but you, you're, both sides of your mind must be very busy. So Cindy, along with her husband, Will, own a cattle and grain farm, plus she teaches at the Comprehensive High School in Swift Current. She has won numerous awards, including two in 2022. She is the YMCA Woman of Distinction for Education and has just received the Queen Elizabeth II Platinum Jubilee Medal. She is president of the Saskatchewan Business Teachers Association. She's on the board of Polytech as well as chairperson of the Great Plains College Board of Governors. She is a champion of financial literacy for all ages and still had time to raise four kids and probably her husband, Will. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our 16th speaker, Cindy Lowe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gord and Keith Willoughby. Thank you, everybody, for being here today with me. Uh, I got to say, this is a dream come true. I started in Edwards in 1992, 30 years ago. And so I just was kind of reflecting on my time, like, oh my gosh, that was my 30th anniversary of being here as a student where this kind of all began for me in financial literacy and education. Um, I'm thrilled to see everyone here, and I'm thrilled to see students. So we brought 42 students from the high school in Swiftgirt, and I see lots of our alumni in the, in the room today that I've taught over the years and that I funnel into Edwards, and I'm, I'm going to talk to the um, Edwards about a commission strategy structure later um, on the number of students I send here. But anyways, I, I'm thrilled to see you guys here. I, I, I think probably I'm preach, pre preaching to the choir because I think everyone in this room probably agrees with what I'm about to talk about. But um, I've got a little bit of an ask, and we need your help. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay out a plan and um, ask you for help at the end of my presentation. I, I like this saying because sometimes we feel like we can't change the world. We can't do big things. And I think this uh, quantifies what I'm about to talk about, that we all, every little one of us can and we can make a difference. And, and that's kind of what my speech is about. Um, okay. We're good to go. Okay, just a bit about my background. When I left Edwards, um, I guess when it started, my career counts, I grew up in Mancota, Saskatchewan, um, a child of entrepreneurs. We had a grocery store, cattle, 
um, ranch and farming, and my parents tried everything. They're entrepreneurs above them. My grandparents, um, my, great, my grandfather was the oldest of 12, and he raised 12 of his own children. He put three of his brothers through medical school by owning businesses. So he owned, he actually owned a grocery store, a mechanic, he was a farmer, and he started the Caste Populaire, which is a credit union in Ferland. And so I'm product of entrepreneurs all the way back, and I think that's, you know, what kind of the skills that I want to talk to you guys about today is that we don't lose that, even, even the spirit of entrepreneurship. Um, when I talked about what I wanted to do as a career, my career counselor said, well, you're good in math, go into commerce. That was the extent of career planning. You guys have all kinds of career planning now. But So I started in Edwards and graduated in 96, and was, I, I majored in finance. I am totally jealous of that room over here, you guys, that trading room. When I walked in and saw it for the first time, I thought, where was that when I was here? So the opportunities you have here to learn about business and finance are endless. And so I was set on uh, selling finance and investments, and I took my securities course, and I started working for the Royal Bank. And I quickly found that a lot of my customers would come in and I would talk to them about saving and investing and they didn't know what I was talking about. So I'd spend my whole hour-long meeting explaining the index chart and the historical returns of the TSX and what the TSX even stood for and realized at the end of my hour I hadn't made a sale. And my job was essentially a salesperson, that I was more of an educator. And so over the years, I also was... Um, dismayed by the level of debt that was coming in my door. In fact, people, I talked to them about saving, and they put me off, let's wait for something, and uh, you know, there were debt levels were, were rising. Um, I distinctly remember a couple that refinanced $75,000 in credit cards on their house because houses in Saskatoon at Lake Ridge had gone up in value and they opened up some equity. The, home, uh, the HELOC program, which is home equity line of credit, had just begun, and people were borrowing against their house like it was an ATM. And so, you know, nobody wanted to save. We were just, and that was in the 90s. Um, we see things far worse now, and I'll review some of those things. So I realized I, I need to teach this. You know, why are people coming to my door not understanding what this is? And so I left um, a career in banking and went to my husband. We got a job at, in Alberta at the time. So I went to U of C and took my education degree. And I worked at some high schools and um, m moved around, and we ended up moving back home around Kyle to farm. And so I got a job, I was fortunate to teach at Great Plains College. Um, their business certificate program. So I taught 11 of the 13 business classes and um, was a, it was an amazing experience for seven years, but a very captive audience. They chose to be there. And so I thought, I need to teach more people this. And so fortunately, a job at Chinook School Division came up, open. I've been there 10 years now and it's honestly my dream job. Um, we have a thousand kids in the school and I'm able to teach financial literacy and previous to that was accounting before finance became a class. I'm also president of the Saskatchewan Business Teachers Association and we, our mandate is to develop future business leaders and Margo's here with me from the organization and we're proud to, you know, to represent um, business teachers and, and grow business education. So this, this forum for me is, a, is an amazing experience and kind of something full circle for me as I come back to Edwards <laughs> 30 years later. So. Uh, I'm also an entrepreneur. He mentioned farming. Um, we have cattle. We, you know, I understand the risks that entrepreneurs take, the struggles that they take, the perseverance. We've got long days and um, in cold weather, you know, hours on our feet working with cattle and harvest. Um, my husband is uh, president of Saskatchewan Cattle Feeders and vice president of National Cattle Feeders, and we both give back to our industries. And he made it today. Usually he's on the farm. And so thanks um, for being here. It, you know, it's not always easy being an entrepreneur, especially not easy being a farmer when we have Mother Nature that kind of works against us sometimes. And so we've endured three years of drought. Um, the top right picture is a crack in the buyer bins that was as wide as my shoe, it was so dry. The bottom right picture is what was left of our canola crop after you know, gophers dug up the seed. We had drought, hail. Um, um, and um, it, what, it didn't finish it off, grasshoppers and crickets came along and, and took the rest of the crop. So, you know, we understand what it's like to persevere. I think we've been farming since 1995, and, you know, you stick it out. And so that entrepreneurial spirit is within us, but it also needs to be within our students too. Um, I just had to throw in this picture here. This was me yesterday. Um, I took some time off from writing my speech to do chores while my husband was coaching hockey. And as I'm on my phone, which I shouldn't be, but it's a good road, we're going slow. Well, it was sheer ice and I right into the ditch, one second. And so right when you talk about overcoming struggles, it's like, are you kidding me? I needed to get home, do my speech, get ready. And um, thankfully a neighbor was watching out his window and saw that my truck looked a little crooked and kind of low and 
pulled me back out. So that's, that was, that's what we do, right, as entrepreneurs. And I love, I can't wait to meet the entrepreneurs in the room that are winning prizes because uh, you guys understand the, the trials and tribulations of owning your own business and overcoming struggles, and so do I. I'm going to talk today about, in a case format, so we teach, you know, with the Sketch and Business Teachers, we hold an annual case competition. It's the 10th anniversary this year, and we're proud to host it in between Edwards and the U of R and U of S, so Paul Hill School of Business is hosting this year. Edwards hosted us last year. And um, we're planning the 10th anniversary. I invite all of you to come. It's the first weekend in May, and the next year we'll be back here at Edwards. And so what we teach is we teach primary topics are entrepreneurship and finance. We give the students cases. They analyze the situation and come up with solutions. And so I'm going to present in a little bit of a format like we teach our kids so you see a, a little bit about what we, uh, what we do with our students. So I'm going to state my problem. So the problem statement here today is that I believe... Oh, the lines got done. I, I converted it from Google Slides to PowerPoint, so if things look a little wonky, that's why. Anyway, so um, my problem statement, financial literacy and entrepreneurial spirit are must be. I'm gonna, and I said are, but I think it's going to change that to must be. Prerequisites for life. Um, I believe that Saskatchewan students need to be required to, or provided the opportunity to take a financial literacy course. They need to have this as a high school requirement in some form, some way or another. And then our problem further to that is we need trained teachers to teach it. Um, and when I say trained teachers to teach it, people that understand it so they can put emotion into it. Uh, I'll give you an example. My first year teaching, in the interview, they asked me if I could teach Physics 20. Well, of course, I said yes. I wanted the job, and I, I, I did a terrible job. And I, there was a teacher who understood physics, and I did not. And the students were like, how come we're not doing experiments like Mr. Ruanowicz's class? I'm like, because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so that's the same in business education. Right? You know, People are daunted by the topic themselves. Everybody is a consumer, and you think could teach it, but it's not. There's, t there's lots of aspects to it. The new curriculum has 47 outcomes that we've developed and so we need trained teachers to teach it. So those are my asks and we come back around to that at the end of the speech. I'll just give you some background on what kids need nowadays to, to graduate and again please don't take it as a slight of anything we're doing. I just see an opportunity for change. Okay and I'll state why but right now the students need 24 credits to graduate. Five of them are in the English language arts, two in 10, one in 11, two in grade 12 two math classes, two science, three social science, a health class, uh, two practical and applied arts classes, and then nine electives. In those electives, you can choose um, basically from over 100 or so classes that we offer. The two practical and applied arts are made up of 47 different choices currently. And we've, we've, I was part of a renewal committee, the, a ministry committee that uh, revamped some of these classes, so there's a few duplicates as the old ones drop off and the new ones come in, but currently there's 47. I pulled out the ones that relate to business education, and so we have account three levels of accounting, we developed another level of entrepreneurship, we developed marketing, which was new this year, and then career and work experience where the kids do experiential learning. Two, financial literacy. We initially proposed one, and the ministry came back with two, which we were thrilled with. Quite frankly, I think it, we need it right down to age of six, like the entrepreneurs we have here today, but we'll settle with two, and, uh, and life transitions. Now, I strongly believe a few things about financial literacy. When I talk to people about learning about finance, once they start to discover financial planning and life planning, it turns into what kind of lifestyle do they want, what kind of career do they want, and they start thinking about career planning. It opens their eyes to, oh, I really should think about my future. We do long-term goals. What's your five-year plan look like? And they start to think about a career. Once they start to think about a career, we got them, right? Then they start thinking about education and planning of that and what courses should they take. I truly believe financial planning, uh, family planning's in there too, right? Oopsie, we have a baby come along. That impacts your financial status, your, fam your, your career planning. You can no longer go to school. What does your family plan look like? You're going to have a spouse or children, take care of elderly or family? Where are you going to live? And then all of that built into all of that is wellness, mental wellness specifically. Um, we see, you know, my time at the bank was long enough, seven years for me to see great distress with finances. I was in with the bank from 95 to 2001. I worked in Foam Lakes, Saskatoon, High River, Turner Valley, and Calgary. And Calgary was Mecca, right? It was, um, there was, you know, everybody was buying. The oil and gas industry was hot. Um, I would work, when I went back to my education degree, I would work a Thursday night and a Saturday shift for the Royal Bank. In three hours, from 5 to 8 p.m., I would see seven to eight credit clients. 
Overdraft, line of credit, visa, refinance, overdraft, line of credit. It was a revolving door. My manager would come to my door, can you see someone else? It was just, and then the, the stresses, right? All of a sudden, guess what? The oil industry is the most volatile industry in the world. So you go from making 300,000 to zero. And, and then you're like, oh, you feel like a failure because you can't make their debt payments. So mental wellness is embedded in all of that. And then the other thing is everyone in this world earns, spends, borrows, saves, invests, and shares money. Everyone. This is not unique to Saskatchewan. This is not a Canadian problem. This is a national problem, a worldwide problem. And I'll show you some stats about what's happening around the world too. So let's do some current situational analysis. In my case, I'm going to talk initially about financial literacy, what it, what it looks like and what we teach. Uh, who knows what FOMO and YOLO look, sound, or stand for? Nice and high. Okay. Who doesn't, I should ask. Right? We see the change in demographics. So FOMO. What does FOMO stand for? Someone raised their hand. Fear of missing out. Can you see how that becomes embedded in spending? Right? We're all on our phones. Millennials are particularly hit hard because you see the, what people are wearing. You're seeing the trends. You're seeing, I want that. Right? You don't want to miss out on that. Everybody else is doing that. And they attribute that to debt. Look at that. 70% of people in the survey attribute a quarter of their debt to just FOMO spending. Right? That you see what they have and you want it. So you don't want to miss out on what other people have. FOMO can also be blamed on crypto, the crypto craze, which I'll come to in a second. And so we have pressure to spend and you don't want to miss out on that. Now, don't be entirely sorry for people that incurred their debt because that last statistic, 38% of Canadians wouldn't give it up, wouldn't give up social media, won't put it down, right? They won't stop looking. And we, our phones are listening to us. They're hearing what you're talking about, a pair of shoes, and it's showing up in your ad. The analytics are there, right? And so they're suggesting what you should buy, and then you see it, and you should buy it. And so that, that's contributing to our debt problem. And then YOLO, what's YOLO stand for? I keep leaning into this, but it's actually right here. <laughs> you only live once. Well... I couldn't help but look up the tickets to the hottest uh, hockey game that we had lately. I think the f this one is fake news. It says 1.1 million for a ticket in section 36. I, 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 saw, I found that on Twitter and I actually think that's fake. And I can stand over here. I keep thinking I'm leaning into this mic. This is, this is new. We need this in my classroom. Somebody here from Swift Green? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if 1.5 one million for that ticket is real or not but either way the tickets were thirty thousand dollars upwards of 30 and the resellers right drive it up the you only live once mentality mrs low and kids have told me that oh mrs low is boring savings no fun right you got to put stuff off but what happens if you have thirty thousand dollars for a ticket that's fine spend away it's the people that don't and put this on credit and think i want the experience and it's worth that debt and then you're paying that could have paid for you know several years of school there's a, a sizable down payment on a house you know a, a vehicle right and and for that ticket so i do that that does trouble me when i see this and hope that everyone in that crowd uh, paid for that with cash because I experienced it at home for free in my couch and so you don't want that I, I call it a financial hangover there's probably a hangover after the game anyways but a, a financial hangover it hurts badly for years to come when you're paying that off the other one I wanted to touch on of course coming up in February is the Super Bowl I always talk about the Super Bowl we look at the ads and ad this year I always have to update what the number is the last year was 5.6 million for a 30 second ad this year it's seven Inflation's hit the Super Bowl ads too, right? Uh, check out the Doritos ads if you have time, especially uh, the one where she's having a baby. It's, it's priceless. But anyways, <laughs> the tickets here now are currently on sale um, for upwards of $20,000 a ticket. This is for sale. And then never mind when they come to the resellers and they start going. So again, if you have the money to spend this, I have no problem. It's the people that are getting into debt for this YOLO experience, you only live once, um, that troubles me. So how are we doing in Saskatchewan? So back, MMP, I follow them. Um, they give a great job in detailing the financial situation. This was when times were good, okay? Nobody knew what was happening at this time. So back in 2019, we weren't faring very well. Manitoba and Saskatchewan were actually the worst in the country and $200 away from insolvency from bankruptcy. And so that's how tight people are living paycheck to paycheck. That's scary in itself alone. Right? What if your car breaks down? You're one month away from not being able to pay your bills and, and it's a trouble. So we, we saw the statistics back then were difficult. Um, now at the bottom line also was part of the survey, fewer than one in three. So a third of people felt like they couldn't survive a life-changing event. Hmm. I wonder what was coming, right? The pandemic. And, and so you won't get a greater life-changing event than, think, than what we've been through. 
And so people, you know, when they say save for a rainy day, there's no rainier day than what we've been through financially in the last two years. Health crisis alone, I'm not going to talk that, about that. We did what we had to do to save lives. But financially, people just weren't ready. There's no savings, there's no plan, and they're on debt. Right? Just YOLO, living for the moment and not expecting what's going to happen. So that was in 2019. Fast forward, they just came out with a consumer debt index report about affordability, and so it's worse. And this is specifically Manitoba and Saskatchewan, that people are not available to, to bathe for their basic necessities of life. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you study that, the bottom line is basic human needs. We spend most of our money just on that, never mind self-actualization and all the other fun stuff. And the bottom line is just getting by and, and feeding and, and living. So almost 50% across the board find that unaffordable. And then the last statistic, we know that was coming, right, when people lost their jobs and we closed down businesses and people started to incur debt just to live. Bankruptcies are up uh, the highest rate of increase in 13 years. So it's, it's a, I don't know, when we left banking, somebody told me that's in banking, if you thought it was bad when you left in 2001, it's worse now. And so, you know, I'm hitting the alarm bell here. That's why we're here today to talk about this. We, this needs to change. Um, and change fast. The average debt for Canadians is about close to $2,500 per month. That's per month. So in a credit card, you're supposed to pay that off in 29 days or 21 days, whatever your grace period is. Are you making $2,500 a month to bring that back to zero? Because if you're not, you're paying 29% calculated daily, compounded monthly to perpetuity. In fact, a little known secret is when you look and it says it's going to take you 243 years to pay this off, they actually charge. So if I charge something today, in January, and I don't pay it off till March, but I continue to spend, but I make payments, the interest is accumulating on that charge in January. I lose the grace period until I zero it out. So people think, well, I'm paying it down, so it's $500 less than I'm paying interest on. No, it's not. If you look in the fine print of the credit card, you're not. And so I also know, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not here to slight the Royal Bank. I, my experience there was, was amazing for myself, but I also know that's how we made money. And so we make most of our money on credit products. And the two biggest products we make most of our money on is credit cards and mortgages. In fact, I looked up the net profit, which is it's Royal Bank's a publicly traded company, $15.8 billion last year off of credit mostly. I mean, we can look at where their income's derived from, but most of it's credit. And I had a boss who said to me, Cindy, they don't leave your office without a credit card. Like every student should have a card card, right? You guys, I was telling my students, we were walking through the tunnel, I'm like, you're fresh meat in the fall because all those guys want to sell you credit cards, right? Get that first credit card in your pocket. They want to give it to you. So um, be because, you, you know, you're tempted, you don't have a lot of money. And so I actually disagreed with him. I said, I'm not, I don't feel ethically well selling credit card to students because I know how broke I was. I had three part-time jobs. And if you'd offered me a credit card, I had one, but I knew that I did not have the means to pay it off next month. My friends might have gone on trips and done whatever and thought it was free money. Um, but, you know, we, I, I, don't, I didn't agree with selling a student a, a credit card. I didn't agree with that statement. But, I mean, that's what's happening, right? You can get pre-approved. I saw a story in the States, somebody's dog got a credit card. I know students have told me their first visa had a $2,500 limit. Why does a student have a $2,500 limit? They don't make that much a month. And so we see debt levels out of control. Um, Garfield, who doesn't love Garfield? Um, so they bought this hat, and, and I, so what this is on the bottom, do you guys know what these are? What are they? So they're Afterpay, Affirm, Paybright, and Klarna. Have you heard of them? What are they? Financing, buy now, pay later. So you don't even need a credit card. You can go shopping, and on checkout, it gives you an option, how do you want to pay? They, there's a, this software is embedded in the online store, and so you can buy now, pay later. So you can finance your clothes, if you want, or whoever's, which stores. Have you bought from your, your Nottings? Does anyone know what stores? You know, they, they're out there, and they're embedded in the, in, the, in the websites that you shop at. So this is alarming, right? But of course people would do this. They know that people want to buy. They want to sell you stuff. That's the goal of, of the business. Um, and they don't really care if you don't have the money for it. And I shouldn't say don't really care. I don't want to sound empathetic. But they want to help you buy that product. So here's a way to do that. In, and even though you're, you're maybe financing something you can't afford either. So that's out there. Um, just a few things. Bed Bath & Beyond just announced bankruptcy proceedings here. I, I had to throw that in. That's a recent development. We see high 17% of businesses considering bankruptcy or permanent closure 
due to financial reasons. So the finances, you know, we, we need to help people in, in terms of businesses. Uh, you know, I really, uh, I'll come back to this, but think that small businesses includes tradespeople. The students I'm bringing today and the students maybe studying business are inclined for business. But where are our tradespeople, our entrepreneurs, our hairdressers? They're starting their business owners. Massage therapy, my friend's daughter was a, a hairdresser. She told me, first of all, what an eye opener because she had to do her invoicing, her GST remittance, her payroll. You know, she just was mind, you know, income statement. She didn't even know what that was. So we are le we're leaving our tradespeople uh, hanging because they need the skills too. One of my friends, you know, was uh, a construction person and he derived his income, right? If he worked, he got paid. Well, he fell off a house and broke his back and six months without work, he declared bankruptcy because he had no emergency savings and no one's paying him uh, you know, sick leave while he's off. So, you know, we, 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 we got to train our, our business people too on, on finances. Um, crypto is a, is a current event that we want to talk about. Have you heard of F uh, FTX and the bankruptcy? So I want to touch on them because I'm going to tie this to Super Bowl. Last year, there was for sure three crypto ads. Uh, FTX was one of them. They had a full minute ad, which means they blew close to 15 million on that ad. And so Sam is 30 years old. He started this in 2019. So three years ago in May, and built his net worth to 32 million. He, like how he built it so quick, but basically crypto is you take real money and invest it into crypto trading platforms. I'm going to totally not get everything right. Young people in the crowd can maybe explain crypto. I've purposely avoided it because it's far too speculative and risky for me, but it's a thing, right? So he built up his net worth. Uh, he had celebrity supporters, you see, uh, supporting it. And well, guess what happened? He's now been charged with eight criminal counts, could spend 155 years in jail because he couldn't keep his hand out of the cookie jar. Basically, it's a Ponzi scheme that he took people's money and then put into crypto and then took it out for himself. And they figure about $7 billion US is lost due to this fraud. Um, and, and, you know, Sam, the guy here on the bottom, $2 million he put in. Like, why are people putting this kind of money in there? And so it, it's, it's terrifying to think that this is a speculative, high-risk investment. When I studied investing and took my securities course, this was like on the bask, last page, right? Speculative, high-risk investments. Don't touch. Put 1% in if you're going to. And so now $77 million billion has been lost or frozen and probably won't come back. So crypto. Um, this is one of the topics, besides this kid being super cute, this is a TED Talk. I've got a few TED Talks I want to uh, suggest you watch. But in financial literacy, one of the things that I'm getting at here is delayed gratification. Is can you wait, right? We're in an instant society, instant messaging, instant coffee, instant food, instant everything. And we're taught that, you know, we're, we're led to believe that that's how it is. And it's fun, right? We like instant stuff. But it's hard to wait. You can buy now, pay later to get whatever you want. But I, we encourage our students to wait, to help that, uh, that um, to resist temptation. So this TED Talk is actually, they theorized that uh, would that be, lead to successful kids. And so this little guy, they put a marshmallow in front of kids. And then if he could wait f 15 minutes and not eat it, uh, they would give him a second marshmallow. And they followed these kids to adulthood and they found they were more successful down the road because they understood very young that if I resist temptation, I'll be rewarded. And that mentality, that mindset, is something we try and teach in financial literacy. Now, it was cute. The video, the TED Talk, if you look it up, there's kids that would smell the marshmallow and just so want it so bad and put it down. There was a girl that ate the inside of the marshmallow and put it away and, you know, got to watch her because she's probably going to be sneaky. But, uh, and there's some that, like, as soon as they walked out of the room, boom, right in their mouth, right? They couldn't resist. So it's just an indicator and something kind of we talk to our kids about about waiting and not buying it on credit. Now, wait till you have the cash. Like, do you have the cash to pay for that TV? Right, why don't you wait two years to buy the TV? Nope, we wanna put it on credit right now. When things get drastic, put it on plastic. And so, um, that ability to wait. Um, this one is the, the beast of all credit products, payday loans. If you wanna watch, if you watch Netflix, there's a series called Dirty Money. There's a couple of them, really good videos. But this one, the, vi the video is called Payday. So who took my class? And watch this with me. Okay, it's a good one. Yeah, see, I'm kind of repeating my story, so forgive me if you guys have heard, but I think if you hear it three times, you're likely to remember it. So uh, it was a good one and went through the devastation caused by payday loans. Uh, they hit, hide the fees. They don't call them interest rates because it's illegal to charge 300%. So they embedded as fees, monthly fees, 
and it accumulates to about 300% on what the people have borrowed. And now what bothers me the most about payday loans is they're usually preying on low-income people. They're doing three, hi Maureen, nice to meet you, see you again. Uh, three, four, five hundred dollar loans that they're, they're financing. And, uh, and then people, obviously too, are not financially literate, right? Perhaps bad credit, preying on people, um, and then uh, they're finding themselves paying for months, if not years. A $300 debt turns into a $900 loan that they pay back. It's 300%. And so I, I'm going to say when we came into Saskatoon, I purposely counted one time. I counted eight. So Cash Express, Money Express, Fast Money, whatever they're called, they're all the same. And there's at least eight on 22nd Street here in town. There used to be one Swift Current, but I ran it out of town. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they're no longer there, but I was going to go talk to them. Uh, so the other thing, right, keeping up with the Joneses, we talk about net worth. And, um, you know, I have two scenarios here. One family has a million dollars worth of stuff and assets, right? Looks like lots of stuff. And, but the debt levels is what we have to consider in terms of wealth. Wealth isn't just what you see. The net worth of the first scenario is $100,000 once they pay off all their debt. But looks, they look wealthy. They have multiple vehicles. They have homes, maybe two homes, toys and all the things. But they have the debt. And so the net worth they only realize is, is $100,000. The scenario two, perhaps less flashy looking assets or less valuable assets, but done a good job of paying back their debt. And so they have a net worth of 350000 So wealth is not what you see, right? It's what is this, right? What you can realize from your assets once you pay off your debt. I actually um, saw this at the bank. Uh, the people you least likely to think that have wealth uh, have gotten all the wealth. I had, we had a farm customer. Uh, honestly, you walked in and thought, oh, okay, what do you guys want? But they had a big bank account. Anyways, they did well at accumulating wealth. And I heard that this is so many folklore, I guess, that the wife would go out and cut the wheat stalks around the power poles to get every last kernel into the bin. And, um, and, and then the ones that look flashy perhaps are, are riding on a, on a pile of debt. So be careful. Um, we like to talk about home ownership. I've shown this picture before. This is in the news. That house was listed for a dollar. And it's a, it's a mentality to try to drive up a bidding war. And so this same house, it doesn't look like much, actually, but it's nice inside. It's pretty cute. But would I pay $1.2 million? I don't know. Uh, 210, it, uh, sorry, 2010, it sold for 320000 So what I worry, what worries me is housing, housing affordability. How are kids going to buy homes, right? Um, stay in Saskatchewan, for one. It's cheaper co um, cost of living. So I hope you guys all stay. But, you know, the government came out recently. I was meeting on the weekend with my SAS business teacher people, and we were planning our event, and Connie mentioned the tax-free first home savings account. I don't have much information besides what she told me, but basically it takes a TFSA, so the investments grow tax-free, and the contribution is tax-deductible, so the best of RSP and TFSA. Now, I think she said a 40000 max, and you have to be only a first-time home buyer to do it, do it, so there's... Um, you know, details there, but it's an effort to help people buy a home. The house still costs $1.2 million, but, uh, you know, housing affordability, mortgage payments, how can you pay it off faster, the biweekly accelerated option where you can le lose like seven years on the average 25-year mortgage. I probably sold 99% of my mortgages were biweekly accelerated, and they didn't even know what it was, and then they explained it, like, what, seven years less? Sure, sign me up. Um, but I know bankers don't... Um, always know that because I myself have a mortgage and I had to ask for that and the person I was dealing with didn't know so I explained it to her and I'm like just put you know put it by week etc and she's like oh that's a new product so you know people don't know these secrets until we maybe teach them uh, financial planning is a big part so when we developed the curriculum uh, I, I like this one here the chance of winning a lottery and I'm, I'm not joking that is my customers financial plans I worked with Kelly, and Kelly was adamant she was winning lottery. It's not when, and we're like, sure, Kelly, you're winning. She goes, no, I am. Well, she's very mad if you made fun of her. And then the other one, right, and wishing for inheritance or money down the road, that's also not a financial plan that's worth counting on. So we talk about financial planning. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, one of the aspects of financial planning, when we developed the curriculum, we talked about, should we include retirement planning to high school students at your age? Yes, I said, yes, we should. Because we know the sooner you start, the more likely you are to accumulate wealth. We can't learn this at 30. You can't walk in at 40 and try to make up time. So in this scenario, we have twins. One started at 22 and saved $40 a week for nine years, so invested 18,000 of their own money at an 8% rate of return with the rule of 72, that's nine years to double. They're starting to double by the time the other twin is just getting going, has zero. So if this person mathematically stopped, they accumulated 398000 
And the other twin saved $40 a week for 35 years and never caught up. Through the magic of compounding, find an investment that makes 8% return and you'll match this. And at people, I would explain this to clients, and I think this is what was really deflating for me and why I wanted to teach it, is that I always told me, oh, wait, I got bills, I'm paying kids. Like, they always had an excuse to wait. And I've told this story before, but I'm going to say it again. Um, when I was at the college, we would, I, one of my classes was um, mathematics of finance. So we do the math behind an annuity. So if I'm 21 and you save to your 60, 55, how much do you have on deposit to last you 40 years for life till you're 95 and do like a life plan? And so, okay, work backwards. This is how much you need on deposit at 65, and here's how much you need to invest at 21. And so we're doing the math, and I had a student kind of sitting in this corner of the room, and she was silently crying over there. So I asked her, and she was 42, newly divorced, taking a first-year business class, so she had no education and fairly low-skilled. And so she, I asked her after what was wrong, and she said, I can't believe what I didn't know. She was devastated because she didn't know this. She's like, why am I just finding this out now? And I think that's when I was like, whoa, we need to go teach this younger. We need to go, we, we need, you guys, we need to go younger even more. Because there's no reason why she should just be finding this out now and not knowing sooner. And she was devastated. She's like, how am I ever going to retire? We actually did the math for her to retire. So I think the initial scenario was 350 a month at 21. She'd have to put $1,250 a month to catch up. That is out of her reach. That was completely unaffordable for her. And, you know, looking at lifelong, like, when is she going to retire? Can she afford to retire? At, right? She's finding out right here and just at zero. Right? There's no reason why she should be finding that now. So that's why, you know, we, we need to teach this. Have fun talking about where to invest and understanding risk and return, risk and reward. Right? That's where we sneak in the whole crypto speculative investment stuff. You know, um, you know, Warren Buffett, one of the greatest investors of all time, right? It, goat, I should use the lingo, hey? So, goat. <laughs> um, he, uh, you know, he talks about it being a marathon, not a sprint to investing, right? Long, passive investing for growth over the long term. And so we, we have an I have investment game we do with our class. So that it's, it's, um, it's a stock market game. The kids can buy uh, stocks. Um, it probably develops into a bit of an addiction for some. Hey, Aiden, where are you? There you are, yes, uh, for some. Uh, and turn it into real life, though, too. That's what I want is to turn it into real life. I did have a student. I know he probably had, uh, you know, was addicted to the game, and I think he'll do just well. He turned, at that year, I gave $100,000 to the students. He turned it into $1.3 million by the end of the semester. <laughs> I think I'm going to invest with him once he graduates from Edwards. I think he's here. So... Um, that we have lots of fun talking about this. Sometimes it becomes a distraction because we have to talk about more than this. But certainly they don't go out in life not knowing what the stock market is. They know already. And that's one of the things I spent tons of time talking about in my office. Um, the whole pension, uh, you know, we, I won't call it a pension problem because pensions are great. We have tons of people in pensions, educators, you know, uh, federal government, government employees, health care. Uh, I'm in a pension, and so I pulled off my report just um, on the weekend. So my pension is locked in until July 2029. I cannot access that money, and so my issue with that, it's a great savings plan, but what if I need $10,000 next month? What if I need $50,000 next month? What if I have an emergency, like a pandemic, that I lose my job and need to access savings? And people are not putting money into emergency funds outside, because we invest in our pension heavily, but what do I have in case I need it? Credit. That's what happens is people turn to credit to bail themselves out. So even people with, fi with fine pensions need to be thinking of savings too. And taxes. Who doesn't love to talk about taxes? I think probably this is the number one request in public about um, kids need to learn how to file taxes. And like they do, they learn it in Finance 30. Like people say that to me all the time, like we actually teach it. Um, so I, I like this one. We, t we, pr we prefer to take a portion of our kids' candy at Halloween because we have to teach them about taxes and taking a third away. But I actually have a little story. So at the bank, of course, when we did loans, I required the, um, the income tax uh, reports. And so I had a customer, distinctly remember this guy, who's a business owner, seemed to be good, and wanted to, I think, loan for a truck or something like that. And said, so, you know, it sounds great, everything looks good, I'll need your three years of income tax. He looks me flat in the eye and says, oh, I don't believe in income tax. And I'm like, I don't think that's a belief. Actually, I think it's the rule. Like, it's the Income Tax Act, it's federal government, I don't know. Seems to me like nothing, something, it's like not believing in not 
plating your car. I, I, I think that's something we have to do in this country. So he never filed. And then he's mad that I couldn't finance him because he was an honorable citizen, had a good credit. And I'm like, sorry, buddy, that's not something you believe in. And it's actually quite easy once we show our students how to do it. And again, that empowers them to have record keeping, to monitor their income, to learn about thresholds of income. Like you only need to make 14,000 before you start earn, paying tax. Did you know that? Like a tax-free savings account. And, and so it builds a lot of confidence just by doing that seminar. So we, with my finance 30s, we accountings, we do a seminar where we file taxes for students at our school. One year, a girl got $826 back that she had overpaid. If she wouldn't have filed, here's a high school kid, who doesn't want $826 in high school and university, right? It was like, what? But she had overpaid, and that's all that happens. But if you don't file, you don't get it back, and there's tons of benefits that can accumulate once you file. So uh, we teach that. Kids need to learn that. Okay, so that's my touch. Like, there's so many. I had to cut out about 20 slides <laughs> when I got going here and, and an hour down. But finance, there's 47 modules in the curriculum, and uh, we have... 100 teachers on the list that teach at various stages across the province, um, but still not everybody's learning it. So uh, entrepreneurial spirit is the other piece of talk that I wanted to talk to you about. So entrepreneurial spirit, these are some aspects that come out of the curriculum in the entrepreneurship program. Of course, fi marketing is fun, financial records, mental wealth and well-being, those are all related to finance. But the one that I like to talk about is the entrepreneurial spirit. Right, the mindset of an entrepreneur. And so we need our kids to think entrepreneurially, to have entrepreneurial spirit, uh, to try something new, to take risks and fail. And so I'll, go, I'll get a couple of things to think about. I love, again, TED Talks. This one is Angela Duckworth, and it's called The Power of Passion and Perseverance, Grit. And so we need to get, her, her point is at the end, we need to get gritty about making our kids grittier. Right, grit is stamina and perseverance and pushing through difficult situations. And we have to admit, the last couple of years were life-changing, especially for our youth, that we retreat from difficult situations, that we don't deal with difficult situations. We saw our students at the school, you know, not come to school uh, for fear, and then that became a, a bit of a paranoia, and then, you know, they, they don't want to push through difficult situations and try and overcome those obstacles. And we know that grittier kids are more likely to graduate, that it actually is a better indicator of graduation than IQ. And it's not, and it breeds this growth mindset that if I fail, it's not permanent, that I just keep going. Like if I get the truck stuck yesterday, I just pull it out and keep going, here we go. So that grittier mindset that we have to be willing to fail. And so this is about teaching the kids that. And she ends her TED talk with, that's where you come in. That's what we need to teach our kids. So that's a really good TED talk to watch. Um, I look at if people would have quit, right? If we quit and don't try hard, look at these things that we wouldn't have had. Albert Einstein was, uh, it says four years old, his teacher said he wouldn't amount to anything. Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team. Oprah was told she wasn't, didn't have a face for television, right? The Beatles, they didn't like their sound. Walt Disney was told he, did, he wasn't creative enough. And then, of course, Steve Jobs fired from Apple. So what if some of these would have quit? We can't imagine our world without these icons, right? And I'll just talk a little bit about Steve for a minute. I read his biography. If you get a chance, it's about this thick. It's amazing. He was a bit of a tyrant to work for. I think he was fairly ruthless with his staff and, you know, sort of he had goals. He was very, very much a visionary, right? He saw the touch screen. Right? Can you imagine living without a touch screen now? He, he, that was something he envisioned. Digital music, he, you know, with the iPod when he came out, revolutionized the music industry overnight. Right? Who wants to lug around records and cassettes and VHSs and, and everything else when you can have digital music and share it on the Apple Music? And so very much a visionary. I love that quote, the ones who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. But I also look at this, this marathon that he went under. So I actually had an Apple IIc in one of his computers back in the 90s, I guess, my, or 80s. Uh, um, it, and, and, the, and uh, you know, he went through lots of bumps and bruises along the way in developing his products. So I looked up the share price of Apple just as an indicator of that marathon. So in 1983, the share price of Apple was 12 cents a share. Sure wish we would have saw that coming, right? And so um, it, in May of 2016, though, Look at how long it endured that was low. 
that went through lots of terrible products, bad press. They had that, anyone have that blue see-through one with a big back on it? That was one of his Apple computers. Lots of bombs along the way. He was a tyrant to work for, so there's, you know, workplace um, climate probably wasn't always the best. He was very demanding. Um, but then if you, once it started, right, it really took off. He, he kind of got his niche. And we can't imagine a world without Apple anymore. The market capitalization of Apple in January here is $2 trillion. And the share price is 129 US. And so the marathon that entrepreneurs go through to develop their idea and build that business is something we, we need to teach our kids, right? We're an in, that instant society I talked about that we want instant gratification. Let's delay that and just see where this goes. Uh, now, our kids need to be entrepreneurial. You need entrepreneurial skills, not just to develop a business for yourself, but to survive the world you're entering, right, in terms of jobs. And I, you'll notice I put some options. You must leave home and do something for yourself. But I, I'm not, kind of not kidding when I say that, because we see kids retreating and not wanting to try hard things. Push them. Get them going. Like, they need to go out there and, and do this. Um, why? A couple things that they, why I want them to be entrepreneurial is the world of work is changing. We've seen this. And, and you need to be ready for jobs that are changing. We see that automation, uh, I like to teach this in my work experience program, replacing jobs all the time, right? So we are seeing jobs being lost through technology. Um, I highlighted Bank Teller because when I started at the bank, Midtown Branch in Saskatoon, one of our jobs, if you've been at Saskatoon Branch, I think it's changed a little bit, but it was wall-to-wall -wall tellers. We were lined up at the door. People saw us for cash, to withdrawals and paying bills. and. Um, we, one of our jobs was to do ATM demos. We were tasked with, I think I had to do five ATM demos. So you came in, Gord came in, cash his little check, and said, Gord, can I show you how to use this at the ATM? And no, thank you, I'd rather come see you, lovely lady. And I'm okay, it's fine, right? But, but the girl behind him, sure, let me show you. I don't want to come into the bank during hours. I work, and I want to do this tonight at 6 o'clock. You still go to the bank, don't you? I knew it, yeah, <laughs> cash, you're the cash guy. He's the cash king here. That's awesome, right? Um, but one, this lady that I worked with, she's like, I'm not going to do a bank teller demo. No damn way. They're taking our jobs. And I'm like, they're already here. <laughs> they're already taking our jobs, right? So you have to change. Did bank tellers become obsolete? No, because guys like Gort keep visiting them. But they also <laughs> change their skills. They need to be entrepreneurial, say, OK, my job is on the chopping block here. How can I pivot and do something else? Okay, so automation. We also know that we have to train our kids to be entrepreneurial because they're preparing for jobs that don't exist. Okay, look backwards, you guys. We were all here 10, 20 years ago. The YouTuber job did not exist, right? We are preparing them for jobs that didn't exist. And some of the jobs that we think are untouchable, like, well, I'm a lawyer. I, can, I won't be replaced by a robot. Well, you kind of can because I can get most of that online and not pay a lawyer to do something that my, I can do my will or whatever, right? Financial advisors would think they're untouchable. Well, no, robo-advisors are a thing, right? I can just get the analytics to do it. I can get some automated program to look at the stock market and buy for me. So we need to think kids to think inter entrepreneurially and perhaps become an entrepreneur, create your own future instead of relying on something. But we, we have to get them to think. We don't know what the future holds, but to think that way is what I want to, to, to get at. Um, you, you had said entrepreneurs are problem solvers, for sure. I had three examples. I mean, there's a million examples about how solving problems, but the first one is out of Sweden. So Sweden actually burns their trash. And I know it sounds bad, but they contain the emissions. And what they do is they take the heat from the trash that they're burning and, and turn into energy. So they, they, they use power their homes through trash. They burn their trash. Only 4% of the trash ends up in the landfill. So we have a huge landfill problem in North America. And we have an energy problem, right? That we can't have enough, we have, you know, consuming more energy than we um, have actually the capacity for. I'll just give you an example. My brother-in-law works in Calgary for the energy company there. They had five, in this last cold blast, they had five crises, five power warnings or something that the grid was actually maxed out and they imported energy from BC and where else did he say? Um, maybe Manitoba or something. So we are consuming a ton of energy if the world goes, continues to go more reliant on energy. They use the heat to turn into energy in Sweden. They actually use so much or, or they actually import garbage into Sweden and, and use it to create this energy. So that's a problem solver, right? We have a problem, let's, let's fix it. I, I went back in time, uh, 1904, this came from one of my friends, Jill sent me this. King Gillette hated sharpening his razors, so he developed the disposable razor. 
this now three billion, we can't imagine our world without those, right? Would you shave if you had to sharpen your razor? I wouldn't. So like, right, but now we have a disposable razor. And then in 2011, this was a creation from India where they found that the plastic utensils was a problem. So they created utensils that are edible made out of a millet, rice, and wheat, and that they can eat them while they eat their food. And then we solve the plastic crisis. So problem solvers, what are problems that we see and how can we fix them? And that's the task for youth, right? Us, we can think that way, but we're kind of old and it's hard to come up with new ideas. But that's the skills we want you to do is to come up with solutions to problems and think that way. I can't talk about entrepreneurship without talking about Murad. This is Murad. Some of my students here are in the room. I see Gage and... LJ and who else is here? Who else is in that picture? But anyways, uh, Murad came to visit us in Swift Current. He started AGT Foods in 2001. This is a sprint, this one, because you know he was named World Entrepreneur of the Year in 2017. And what he saw was an opportunity to sell protein-based food that we grow in Saskatchewan around the world. So let's make it happen. He had to talk a little bit. It was hard at the start, he admit, he had to create a, uh, convince farmers to produce this, but then export it. So right now, well, when he visited us, I think it was 47 countries around the world he exported to. And, um, you know, he continues to make headway and solve problems. So now we know getting to market is a problem. So he forms part of the Arctic Gateway Group to get our lentils in our Durham to the Mediterranean uh, up in northern Manitoba. So, you know, he is a true problem solver. And Saskatchewan spirit uh, is there and uh, other Davidson, right? And so... Um, he is a fine example. He supports the football in, in Regina. He makes his home in Regina and continuing to change the world. And the cool part is selling our products abroad, right? We are good at growing food. We have the land to do it. And so they use what we have and add value to it. So as a farmer, I appreciate his efforts. Uh, and the last one I wanted to mention about entrepreneurship is this TED Talk. It says, let's raise kids to be entrepreneurs. This guy, kind of everything I just talked about, he said, there are problems out there that somebody has an idea for. This, I sent you this video. This one is one of my favorites. Yes. Yeah, and so, you know, some kids don't love school and they struggle a little bit with school. Maybe they are an entrepreneur in the making. Like, get them through, but, you know, tap into that spirit and help them become an entrepreneur. Okay, pros of this, this is in case scenario. Uh, this is my, my icing on the cake situation. I believe that business education is an equalizer. It's regardless of where you come from. It's regardless of your age, your race, your religion, your upbringing, whether you come from you know, a newcomer to Canada, the division between economic classes, Business education is an equalizer. Just because where you came from doesn't mean where you're going to be. You came from a low-income household, you can create a future for yourself. In fact, you might come from a high-income household and have no idea how to manage your money. I look at it as an equalizer for across race and religion. Newcomers to Canada all need to know. My friend, is, her parents are from India. When they came to Canada, they were given a credit card and they thought it was free money. They didn't understand. And so they got themselves into trouble very quickly. Mabel told me that story. So it's an equalizer. And again, we are a free and democratic society, right? Everyone can prosper when given the chance. But if you don't have the knowledge, how are you going to do that? And so knowledge is power. And I, and I believe, in fact, that first line, it's a human right. I gave out some booklets with some write-up. It's basically everything kind of that you can take with you to, to sell this, right, this idea. But it's a basic human right because we have access to housing and food as a way to support ourselves. That's through financial literacy and entrepreneurship. I'll just touch quickly on this. My friend Crystal worked for this bank. So it was in Holland, and she did microfinance to women in, in Bangladesh. Crystal's lived all over the world. She's currently in Brazil. She's from Moosja. This was the most impoverished area she's ever seen. It was awful. She would actually visit women that lived on garbage dumps outside of cities in Bangladesh because it's very lucrative to live on a garbage dump because rich people throw out nice stuff. And so she would give microfinance credit. So it's small finance, two $300 loans to women to start businesses. And so the women that she met with would do, what they were selling was helping them establish cell phone companies. So they would sell cell phones to other women. And once you get a cell phone in your hand and internet, you have access to commerce and education and life changing. So this bank, they said to date, 10 million borrowers helped, $38 million lent out, 97% are female. So it's changing their lives and creating a future for themselves through business education and entrepreneurship. Uh, entrepreneurship, I believe, is a path to reconciliation too. Right? This has to be top of mind when we work towards truth and reconciliation going forward. We can't talk about this without Kendall Netmaker. So Kendall is a Bachelor of Education, was a teacher. 
He's extremely accomplished. He's an entrepreneur who's built a business for himself, so Nietzsche Gear. He uh, you know, sells products and then gives back to help kids in sports. So he actually talked about his starting. He, his mom took him off the reserve. They went to school. He was working in this school, and he wanted to play on the sports team. And his mom didn't have money. So I believe it was a doctor in the town that gave him money to help play on that sports team. And so he helps, what was it? His car. His car? Oh, yeah, drove him too. Helped him create an opportunity and future for himself. So he sees himself as a gift. He has a gift. If you ever see him speak, mind-blowing stuff. He's an entrepreneur that has a gift to help heal, right, and move forward and create opportunity for people, for his people. Of course, Chief Cadmus Delorum, the chief at uh, Cowessness First Nation. He's got a Master of Public Policy, a Public Admin, a Bachelor in Business. Uh, if you see this guy speak, he, I saw him at Regina Chamber of Commerce and um, you know, entrepreneurial for his people. He's, you know, chief spokesperson in terms of truth and reconciliation, a message of hope, and to create a future economically for, for themselves. This is Thomas Benjo. Do you know Thomas Benjo? So Thomas is uh, a graduate from the business program at First Nations University. I've recently met Thomas. He worked with the Royal Bank in Aboriginal markets, and he's now the CEO of H FHQ Developments. And so he believes in creating wealth as a path to reconciliation uh, for Indigenous people. And then the last one, I believe you might know her. She's a graduate from the University of Saskatchewan. She's a B.Ed. Um, this, she's got, it's called Oasis Boutique. And she's found a way to create a business for herself. That um, sweatshirt says teacher, and then it's Cree for teacher. And so she, uh, there was a great write-up on her. You know, she used entrepreneurship as a way to celebrate her upbringing and her roots and representing her, her people. So, I mean, there's tons and tons of stories, but it's a path to reconciliation, to create a future for themselves. And I do want to acknowledge Edward's work, um, the certificate that you guys have in Aboriginal business that leads into a bachelor's degree and your Rawlingson Centre for Indigenous students to, to work with and get help. So kudos to you guys for leading that way and finding a safe space for students to come here and study. So I really believe business education is a pathway to that too. Okay, the power of education, we know it's powerful. That was the other part of my speech. And um, we look at some of these things that education does for people. Increased income, reduces poverty, boosts economic growth. Right? Those are all factors that influence. And so that is part of this, what I'm talking about here. Some cons are part of a case presentation. Um, I said um, that there's pros, but there's only one con I can see is not doing it. Right? Not doing what I'm talking about can lead to further anxiety, you know, family abuse, substance abuse, relationship problems, health problems. Employers see redux, reduced po uh, productivity. People are at work worried about their money. Uh, you know, things, um, like I said, now are worse than when I left banking, and we need to do something. We need to fix this Band-Aid. Okay, part of a case thing is then recommending what to do. Uh, this is an interview. I usually get my students in my class to interview adults in their life. Uh, financial questions and one of the questions I ask is was there something you would do over again in your life without a doubt over than 50 percent everybody says I wish I would have invested more I wish I would have started earlier everybody talks about that when the responses come back from the adults nobody says oh geez I wish I would have borrowed more money uh, right they never say that they wish I, they would have started sooner so let's get kids learning about this I asked my business teacher group what their students are telling them and Margo's here you know, she said the Entrepreneurship 30 was one of the most important classes she took in high school, helping her get with her future. Uh, Campbell Collegiate student Jill is one of our executives, teaches in Campbell, and her student took her Finance 30 course, turned it into an entrepreneurship. So she has uh, Shiroka. Um, it's a tutoring. If you look at it, it's great. She's got little people along the bottom. She runs a business. B, as smart as you can be. She's got a little B, right? And so she's learned a lot and turned it into a business, one of the most important classes. I asked one of my students to tell me what business education meant to her, and it meant the world in the, in the transferable skills too, right? Not just creating opportunities, but to creating um, analysis skills, critical thinking skills that are transferable to anywhere in your life. Uh, and also, recommend, on my recommendation, we see self-employment and, uh, and entrepreneurship is actually essential to the Canadian economy, especially to, in recovery as we come out of this pandemic, because we know employers create jobs. So if I create a business, I hire you and I hire you and, and money goes on. In fact, if you study you know, economics, they talk about a, a multiplier effect. So every dollar I spend multiplies in the economy. And let's just say five, five's a number we used to talk about. Um, if I spend a dollar, it turns into five dollars in the economy. It's very circular. And so we need people to create businesses to, to help us recover. And then that in turn turns into employment and jobs and, and fuels everyone, right? Because jobs is number one. 
thing that people need. So in terms of recommendations, um, why I need your help is in 2020, this was written by the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce, sent this letter to the ministry, and um, they recommended four things. So the first one says the Saskatchewan ministry make financial literacy mandatory. We have not done that one yet. Number two, that they develop financial literacy resources. That's been done. We finished that in 2019 and rolled it out, and now we're teaching more and more all the time. Number three, I've got a check mark that would become part of the practical and applied arts curriculum, which we've done. And number four, we still haven't done, and that is to train teachers to instruct this course. So those are my recommendations, these two. So help drive student demand, and then help train educators. So I've got chicken and egg, which one comes first? We've kind of done the student demand part, and so I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to implement this going forward. So trained educators, there's ideas we have. So at the top, a, a dual, a bachelor of education, you could take and then take a certificate here at Edwards, a one-year certificate. At U of S, U of R, you can do that. Uh, take a Bachelor of Commerce and a Bachelor of Education. I did that, so I took a second degree in, in Calgary. You could take a Bachelor of Education with a business major. That exists in UBC, but it does not exist in Saskatchewan. So those are in my ask on the bottom. So the top three are we're doing the bottom one, a combined degree, BCom, BED. So where they're joined, kind of like your... Um, Com what's that? Well, there's, well, I just was going to say law, right? Right, business law. You have a business degree and a law degree, right? So combine the degree. So Lisa teaches in Swift Grant. She has that from University of Lethbridge. Let's do that here. Um, why don't we reinstate, so uh, U of R used to have a business education major in their education program. They cut it. Lack of enrollment. What? Right? So we have more business classes than ever, but no students taking this. So go in to be a teacher. And Margo and I are going to retire and replace us and teach around the province. And so we need to reinstate that business major. We've talked. It's a long process, right? And, and we, could, we have an education college over here. Why don't they have a major in business? Part of it's due to demand, right? If we have low enrollment, they can't keep it running. We get that. But part of it is creating that might take a long time. Now, years of time is ticking away here. So that's not a quick solution, but something we'd love to see. And then I asked, um, the U of R suggested this business electives in a Bachelor of Education program too. So if you're keen on being a teacher, throw in some business electives here from Edwards and learn just some of these essential things. So there's ways we can train teachers. We spend a lot of time putting together resources. I've got a Google Drive and kind of a digital hoarder that I share with anyone and everyone. Put it on Facebook, go access this, teach. Can I use this? Absolutely. None of it, just share away and teach this to kids, please. So that's one of our recommendations. Student demand is the other one. We see students taking the course. You'll see a huge jump from when it was a, lo a locally developed option to when it rolled out. So 2019, we rolled it out to schools. Um, the only number I could access the number of students in Saskatchewan from grades 10 to 12 was in 2019-2020. So these are numbers from the ministry. And so at that time, 18.8% of 10 to 12 students had taken this class. We have 180,000 students, though, in K to 12. So we're starting at grade 11, and that's fine, but we have more work to do. The other one I wanted to add into student demand is what about here in the university? Right? I have a friend who went through commerce with me. I took a finance degree. He took marketing. That's great, but he didn't learn personal finance, didn't grow up with personal finance. Got his marketing degree. We were in ISEC together, so we were all interna international stuff. And Ryan wanted to go to Columbia for six months. So off he goes, graduates, and a student loan. Let's deal with that when I come home. Didn't uh, realize it would begin repayment. So he came in, came back to Saskatchewan, was already in collection with his student loan and phoned me at the Royal Bank and asked me for help. Well, no, I couldn't help him. And he's in marketing, but didn't learn finance, didn't learn personal finance. I was talking with someone here today, too, about being in marketing and not necessarily learning personal finance. So student demand is not just in high school. It's at college, it's at trades. Ask Polytech kids down to do this and teach their trades kids that are taking apprenticeship programs and future entrepreneurs in business. And so we have, I think, these classes. It's let's get more kids taking it. Okay, just wanted to give you a little bit of perspective. I know I'm probably running over time. I didn't keep my timer going, but um, how are we doing outside of Saskatchewan? So in the states, 27 states require schools to at least offer the class. Um, in terms of requirement to graduate, it's down up to 15 states require it to graduate. Now, how are they doing in mentally? Um, in 2003, there was a survey done just here in January. 58% adults felt good. Perhaps some of the adults didn't 
take financial literacy, but I was, I was positively optimistic about 70% of teens felt good about their finances. So perhaps it's trickling down. The kids are feeling empowered, you've got lots of resources, that they feel good about it. Um, how did they do it in the States? Well, this is just in Florida. What they did is take some of their required electives that I mentioned and just shave one of them off and add finance in there. So we could do that here. I go back to where I was. We have five Englishes and two practical and applied and nine electives. Because finance is in this practical and applied one, why don't we, you know, I don't want to hang English out to dry, but maybe we make an English 10 and English 20 and English 30 and throw a few down into the practical applied and make one of those ones a finance class, right? Because we could pull out some of these and make one of them one of those electives. That's just a suggestion, um, but that would change the requirements to graduate, which is a massive shift. Now, fortunately, um, we have a couple of options. I wanted to also shout out again to Edwards. Com 101 is a dual credit that you can take in high school. And I know lots of kids that we talk about taking, and probably lots in this room have taken this class. That is an option. But I also know, oh, actually, just skip ahead to this. Right now, they're looking at, there's a curriculum advisory committee that's looking at requirement to graduate. So this is perfect timing that you invited me here. Um, I know they've talked about, I've, ta I've talked to people on this list. I think some of them are obsolete, like Steve McClellan's no longer with the SAS Chamber, and some of these positions have changed around, but it's on the radar. Now, are they going to change what they're doing? Or do they even know this is a concern? We've been very vocal in raising our uh, voice, and, and I'm asking for your help um, to, to do the same. I just want to give you, whoops, I want to give you just a perspective on what's happening around the province. Uh, and, and across Canada, no one has required financial literacy yet. Manitoba has some classes. They actually allow students to major in business in high school, kind of like a French immersion designation. But they, get, they can say, that, tell an employer, I majored in business in high school. If they take eight out of the 12 classes, that's cool. Ontario has a pretty decent group of courses, but it's optional. Kids can pick. Alberta has this cluster of business classes that they can take, again, optional. Uh, I found just Denmark and Sweden, because I love Sweden. They both have required mandatory financial literacy programs. So there's work being done, but certainly not enough. Okay, and that brings me to my end, my ask. I hear all the time, I wish I had this in high school, Cindy, what you're doing in Safeway, at Walmart, at hockey games, almost daily people say to us, oh my goodness, what you're teaching is so important. I wish you had this in high school. Let's change that. So people are saying, wow, am I ever glad I had this in high school, that I had the opportunity to take this. So that's where you guys come in. And that's where I'll leave this. Tell your friends, your family, if you agree with what I've said here today, if you believe in this topic, tell high school officials, school divisions, post-secondaries, anyone who will listen. Government officials, of course, need to change the requirements to graduate if that's what we want to make this change happen. So thank you for listening, thank you for coming, and thank you for your support. Probably don't have. No, we got. She speaks fast. She covers a lot. My hands still go around quite, quite dramatically. But we'll, we'll take a couple free questions because I know uh, we've got a few other things. Yes. Like handing out cash. But if <laughs> anybody has a quick question for Cindy. Yep. If you were to start everything over again, what would you do? Personally? Um, I actually, I know I'm stumped for words, hard to believe. Um, I don't think I would. You know, an entrepreneur would tell you we learn through our mistakes. Um, would I have married a farmer? I hung out at the Ag College of Agriculture, so I think that was what I th had in mind. Um, would I, uh, I have to say, I'm really, what, instead of what I do over, I'm glad I started at the bank. I cannot underscore what I learned at the bank. And um, I didn't end up continuing because I felt my, uh, driven to go somewhere else. But consider a career in financial services if you wanted to some place to start. They're, they're short of staff. Um, and what I learned there was invaluable. And uh, so we learned through our mistakes. So far, so good, Aiden. Yeah? Oh, well, you know, I, I can, I'm no longer watching. I'm, I'm now relying on the experts of others, advice of others. I'm just going to flip ahead to um, just something to consider. I do, I'm not investment advice, but um, any investment advisor would tell you uh, an index fund 
right? This is a global tech fund, some kind of general mutual fund that's passive, that can you know, stand the test of time. They can build and accumulate. Because when the markets are down, you dollar cost average, you buy lower. When the markets are up, you're buying at a high price. So invest $50 a month. Invest regularly and invest often. So if the market's up, you buy at a higher price. If the market's down, you buy more, you get more shares. So, you know, there's a saying, when's the best time to plant a tree? Now. Same with investing. Start now into an investment fund. Just walk into your branch. Somebody was commenting to me, well, there's nobody helps me when I'm, I'm not the big, I don't have a million dollars to invest. Who's going to help me? Walk in and ask for help. Uh, insist. You guys know now enough to walk in and ask for help. Say, oh, just want to go into a general mutual fund. They'll sell you one. It's balanced fund. Just go into a balanced fund. It's got stocks, international, Canada, U.S., you know, some aggressive, some safe. Just go into a general balanced fund. Buy regularly. Start now is my advice. Yeah. Last one. Um, I think I've been asked lots of times, is this a math class? Like they think it's mathematical. It's not at all. In fact, I don't want to use math. I'll use the calculators online. I think they're scared off by the fear of the unknown. It's still relatively new. I'm happy to say we have four full classes in my school. We have, Jill said, I think seven financial literacy classes at Campbell, right? I think knowledge is power and people learning about what's to offer. But I think they're scared off because they think it's hard. And I'm like, not at all. Ask my students. It's fun. We tell stories, watch videos. Complete your mark, you get a good mark. Like, right? It's, I think they're scared of what's, they think it's hard. It's not at all. In fact, I had, I'll just give you feedback from one student and then we can be done. He said to me at the end, I said, what do you think about finance? He's like, Mrs. Lowe, I almost didn't take this class. Like, what if I wouldn't have taken this class? I learned so much. Like, I wouldn't have known all that stuff. He was almost having a panic attack because what if he wouldn't have taken it? He learned so much. So I think they don't realize what they don't know. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hello, there we are. I don't think Cindy's very passionate about this. <laughs> she said, I've, I've condensed my talk down to 30 minutes. <laughs> Anyways, everybody was fascinated with your talk. And, and the richest man in, in the town I grew up in, the farming community, Rosetown, uh, drove a 20-year-old 49 Ford, he had old clothes, and he owned about 13 sections of land. So it, uh, I agree with you. Uh, they don't often show their wealth. And the other thing was uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, I think he would never invest in tech until the iPod and music. And then he, real he could see Apple. That was a continuing fee that came in every month. So he didn't take it as a tech product, but as a, a something you're selling every month. So uh, great talk. Uh, I, I learned lots. Yes. Um, now, I want to say right off the top, all, all the young people who are here to probably just see me, it has nothing to do with the cash, uh, please don't leave after the, we're done here because we want to take some photos. And we're going to have our, we have our Get a Bigger Wagon comics. And last year we had the 15th anniversary and in the centerfold, in the centerfold was all our guest speakers. Our fifth anniversary, we're going to have a third comic and all the winners from the past five years of the Get a Bigger Wagon uh, presentations uh, are going to be in there. So you're going to see your picture in the centerfold. In, in, in a comic book, which we're going to mail to you. So it'll be lots of fun. Um, there's lots of people I'd like to thank, but in the, uh, in, in the, to speed things up, you people know who you are that help us put this on every year, and Carly and her team, and uh, uh, we appreciate all your hard work. And, and Cindy, you mentioned it was 30 years ago you took this class Last year, we gave our 25th entrepreneurial uh, scholarship. So this is 26 years. We almost, we almost crossed there, which I found was interesting. Everybody knows the goals of the Get Rigger Wagon Awards. It's to encourage kids to start businesses and to reward them. And they've been so patient I'm not going to go through all my stuff. I had some great jokes about 
the Dean, the Green Machine, Willoughby, had on some great material that I'm, I'm not going to get into, and I'm going to skip right to the back and get to the good stuff, which is handing out the categories. And we really had an exceptional amount of uh, entries, talented entries this year. And I think it was because the kids are watching the videos online because the quality from year one to year five is making this decision of who wins so difficult that instead of four winners, we have eight winners in our four categories. And unlike a lot of other places that would divide the prize money according to the number of winners, we're going to give everybody the same amount of money who won. Uh, Maureen and I worked a couple extra shifts at Walmart and uh, to make up for the extra differences in, in the cash we needed. So, uh, and it's funny, when you go to the bank, there's a $10,000 uh, signal, you know, if you're depositing, taking money, what are you doing, and drugs. Oh, we had to go get $9,500 and $50, $50 bills. And Cindy Lowe, because I go to the bank all the time, <laughs> they knew I was legit, and I didn't have to go with a note from somebody and said, this is the reason this man is dealing in $50 bills. <laughs> so anyway, just a small aside. So let's start, if I can ask my, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry, Terry. Yeah, let's, we're going I know everybody, it's been a long time. We have a short video, a condensed version of the kids' uh, uh, videos. So. Let's have, we'll just take a few minutes and see that. store, The Real Fish Girl. I sell fish hooks online and at trade shows. I buy fish hooks to resell and I make some with my grandpa's help. If I win, I want to add t-shirts and bunny hugs for kids and adults. Thanks for the opportunity. Hi, my name is Ava, and I have a business called the Awesome Toys Store. I sell awesome toys for awesome kids. It's an online store, but we're also started doing trade shows this year. Doing trade shows has been really good for my business. Not only we sell toys there, but it's a good way to see what kids are looking for and talk to them. Hi, my name is Mary Kinder, and I'm 11 years old and live on a small farm outside of Davidson, Saskatchewan. But every day, a whole bunch of cars come into our yard because of Mom's store, and I wanted to get in the action. So I started a lemonade stand. So we had a fridge in, uh, like we had this old fridge that we had spare, and we hooked it up in my Mom's store. Once the fridge was ready to go, I made signs and did some Facebook advertising, which made 15,000 people saw it in one post. Um, I would get paid in the honor system, so I just hope people don't steal. I made $215 in two months. Hello. 
Hello, my name is Hannah Forrester. I'm 14 years old and I live in Humble, Saskatchewan. Today, I will be talking about my business. It's called One of a Kind. In my business, I sew and sell tooth fairy pillows. A tooth fairy pillow is a small pillow with a pocket in the front to hold a child's tooth and to hold the money they receive from the tooth fairy. I now have tooth fairy pillows at three gift shops in Saskatchewan and plan to expand to an online business. Here is a quick time lapse showing most of the process it takes to make a tooth fairy pillow. It takes me roughly 45 minutes to complete one tooth fairy pillow. For reference, here's what my Tooth Fairy pillows look like today, and here's what they look like when I first started my business. Thank you for listening about my business, one of a kind. Hi, my name is Sia Kinnivik and I'm 13 years old. I'm the founder of Abella Galita, which started out as a small business when I was 10. We had moved to Italy at the time, and I had been saving up for 18 months to buy four laying hens, a coop, and their supplies. I knew nothing about raising chickens, but knew I wanted to get them because their personalities and their beautiful eggs. In 2021, we moved back to Canada, and we lived on an acreage that had a building, so I asked my parents if I could use part of that building to expand my business. I also have an Instagram account where I can get to customers. My Instagram account also is a way to post funny chicken videos or any posts about keeping my customers up to date. My customers buy my eggs because they think they are healthy, local, pretty, and of course delicious. Chickens are a lot of work and I have to look after them daily. I've learned a lot over the years such as caring for sick chickens and protecting them from predators. Thank you Mr. and Mrs. Haddock for this opportunity. Hi there, my name is Kenzie Pollock and I'd love to share my business with you. I am 13 years old and in grade 8. I'm the founder and CEO of Snickerdoodle Design. This is where it all started. I crafted a Christmas card at, as a school project for my parents. My parents and aunt were so impressed, they encouraged me to make more to sell. Snickerdoodle Design was born five days before Christmas of 2021. I asked my mom to post some samples of cards on Facebook, and the responses were amazing. In January, my mom helped me officially set up my business with a budget to track inventories, time, sales, expenses, and revenues. We also created a website and a digital presence to support our marketing efforts. This summer, I learned even more about budgeting and money management at the Edwards School of Business Young Entrepreneurs Camp. My future for Snickerdoodle Design involves bigger events, more products, and my first ever big craft show, which is in November in Warman, where I will be registered as a young entrepreneur. I registered for a second one at my school not long after. I'm working hard to design my displays and build enough stock for the sales. If I were to win Get a Bigger Wagon, it would unlock another door to my business. I'd be able to invest in more marketing opportunities, buy more inventory to create stock, experiment by venturing into different types into different types of products, and sign up for more sale opportunities. I am also saving up for courses because I would really like to learn more about business and finance. Thank you for this opportunity to showcase my hard work and for your time and consi- consideration. Hi, my name is Kai Halbrick. I'm 18 and I'm the owner of Hobby Yard Maintenance and Landscaping. At this time of the year, we provide snow removal to approximately 80 customers in the Sofgrant area, including businesses, condos, and residential homes. My business is service-oriented, providing snow removal in the winter months, lawn maintenance and landscaping in the spring, summer, and fall. We had approximately 30 lawn accounts this summer, which was awesome. We also did approximately 15 landscaping projects this summer. This is an example of one right here. This is one of my favorite projects we did. We tore out most of the yard and replaced it with river rock and edger bricks. And then we gave them a nice patio to enjoy our morning coffee on or just chat with friends late at night. I decided to start this business last fall in grade 12. I talked to my mom about a loan for a snowblower and she helped me with that, which really kickstarted my business to start off the year. This is an example of the sod we did. 
you dig it out, put it in topsoil, and then add freshly laid sod to the top. It's one of my favorite jobs to do. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this competition. My name is Ashley Walner. I'm 17 years old from Valmer, Saskatchewan. I am the face behind Ashley's Cookies, where I create custom cakes, cookies, and cupcakes. From a very young age, I've always had a passion for baking. October 14th, 2020, I decided to create a separate Facebook page called Ashley's Cookies, as well as extend orders to custom cakes, and that was the official start to the business. I also had the opportunity to make my cousin's wedding cake, which was very special. Cookies also make for the perfect thank you gift, and I've been able to give back to things important to me by donating and gifting my baking. I would just like to express my gratitude to everyone who has helped me out along this journey, including all my clients and my mom who's willing to give up her kitchen for me to pursue this. I would also like to send out a huge thanks to the Edwards School of Business and the Haddock family for putting on this contest and giving young entrepreneurs this opportunity. The Saskatchewan Business Teachers Association is made up of teachers from across the province who teach accounting, marketing, finance, entrepreneurship, info pro, and work experience. We work together to plan and develop a case competition for students and an annual teachers conference every May. We host community members and community groups and speakers to help train our teachers and develop business education. We work together to train other teachers on how to teach business and develop resources with the ministry. We often host guest speakers and entrepreneurs in our rooms, classrooms, and host money fairs in our communities to help train our students on how to teach and learn business. Junior Achievement is a program that is paired with the entrepreneurship class that lets students actually build their own business and go through with it. The hardest thing is to come up with an idea that keeps everybody busy, has a role so everybody feels valued. It's a viable business idea, plus where can we do it? Production has to take place either in the classroom or if they need, can we go to one of the other places in the school? When they figure out their startup costs, they have to budget and figure out how we're going to package it, where we're going to get our supplies from. If they don't have enough, they have to problem solve. It really prepares them for getting out there in the real world. In business class, I learned about saving and investment, credit and credit cards, working as a team, public speaking and having confidence when you speak. It prepared me for university and the business classes I'm taking in university and it makes a real life connection more than any other class I've taken. The goal is to teach kids about financial literacy and start earlier where they can manage their credit, they can spend within their means and they have some retirement planning and some savings. Because no matter what a kid ends up doing, they need to know this stuff. The business club is mostly dealing with financial literacy and talking about like entrepreneurship, finance, and we also last year incorporated debate as well. I think it's really essential because it's in your everyday life. You're going to encounter it no matter what. And it just builds so many different skills like organization, managing money, and just creating a successful life for yourself. All right. <laughs> Now we'll just do a mic check. How are we doing out there? Can you hear me? So let's get to the good part, the uh, handing out of the cash. And uh, let's start off with the seven to nine-year-old category first. And the winner of that $500 is Brooke Martin. Do you want to come up here, Brooke? <laughs> Yeah. You want to come around here? There we He's go. Oh, you got that part right. <laughs> okay, there's 50, 100, 50, 200, 50, 300, 50, 400, 50, 500. Well, let me shake your hand. Look over here. Look over there. Now, I've just got a little microphone and I've just got... Turn this on, and what are you gonna what are you gonna do with your five hundred? I'm gonna pay for t-shirts and sw sweaters. And you're gonna sell those, right? Yeah. Ah, well done. Reinvestment in your business. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. 
I like that. The dean would like that as well. Okay, the second uh, group is the 10 to 12 year olds. And we have two winners of that category and $750. And the first winner is Ava Martin. Now that sounds familiar. <laughs> I, I, I think entrepreneurism is alive and well in that family. So, did you teach your younger sister everything you knew? <laughs> 50, 1, 50, 2, 50, 3, 50, 4, 50, 5, 50, 6, 50, 7, 750. You want to shake hands for that kind of cat? <laughs> and, wh and what are you going to do with your cat? I'm going to buy more awesome toys for more awesome kids. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Reinvest. Thank you. <laughs> the uh, other winner in that category was uh, Mary Kinder, and she's on a once-in-a-lifetime trip with her family, so she's not available, and we'll meet with her later in the month and, and uh, give her her cash. The third group, and again, this category was filled with such great winners. We not only had one winner, not two winners, but three winners, and each winner will receive a thousand dollars. And our first winner of a thousand is Thea Knitting. Can you say what she did last night? Yeah. <laughs> I should note that mm -hmm. she got flew in from Italy last night, arrived at 1 o'clock this morning, but still managed the energy to come and Do you think we can get the cash. Oh. She's got eggs for us. She's got, oh, oh, oh multicolored multi eggs. Did you, <laughs> did you bring them from Italy? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, give me a hand. How do you do? <laughs> All right, 50, 1, 50, 2, 50, 3, 50, 4, 50, 5, 50, 6, 50, 7, whoop, 50, 8, 50, 9, 950, 1,000. And what do you plan to do with your $1,000? I plan on uh, buying around 30 more laying hens and then expanding their coop. All right. <laughs> well done. Well, we'll shake hands. We'll shake hands. We'll look over there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, the second winner of $1,000 is Kenzie Pollock. Would you please come up? Oh, well, there she is. Congratulations. Oh, oh. brides. This is wonderful. It's like Christmas. <laughs> so if you want to come right here, and then we'll go. And have you figured out what you have to do? Okay. <laughs> 50, 1, 50, 2. Better use two hands. 50, 3, 50, 4, 50, 5, 50, 6, 50, 7, 50, 8, 50, 9, 50, 1,000. So... And congratulations. Then look over here at the camera guy. <laughs> and, what, and what are you going to do with your money? Uh, invest. Invest back in your business or it, invest uh, what's it, in stocks. stocks and shares? Uh, <laughs> Some of each. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. Thanks. <laughs> And the third winner in that category, and a thousand dollars, is Hannah Forster. There she goes. There she is. <laughs> Would you rather have a check? No. No. Oh, okay. Just thought I just thought I'd check. All right. Fifty. One. Fifty. Better use two hands. <laughs> Two, fifty, three, fifty, four, fifty, five, fifty, six, fifty, seven, fifty, eight, fifty, nine, nine, fifty, one thousand. And I'd shake hands and look over here. And what are you going to do with your cash? I'm going to 
get some better equipment for making tooth fairy pillows. Ah, the <laughs> equipment, right on. <laughs> Okay, now I get my right notes here. Okay, and the fourth category is the 16 to 18 year olds, and we had two winners, and each of them will get $1,500. And the first winner of that category is Kai Haubert. Kai, are you out there? Oh. Hey. 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 Glad to see you. He, a uh, little business, uh, little, he employs people. And he grossed uh, $50,000 last year, which is pretty good. Uh, <laughs> he might have made more, but that's a statement I saw. Oh, two hands there, big guy. 51, 52, 53, sorry, phone call. Yep, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 51,000. 51, 52, 53, 54, 50, 1,500 bucks. <laughs> and are you going to reinvest in equipment or what are you going to do with your cash? Probably maintenance more likely than not. Yeah. <laughs> so, we'll start your portfolio. <laughs> yes, yes, and congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And the second winner of the 16 to 18 is Ashley Waldner, and she gets $1,500. Oh, oh, steal those. Yep. Okay. Yeah, the cookie, Thank you. cookie crazy girl. All right, you ready? 51. 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 50, 1,000. 51, 52, 53, 54, 50, 1,500. Not bad for making cookies, eh? Uh, uh, let's take our cookies. Uh, and what are you going to... What are you going to invest in? With your dough. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. It'll uh, come back to the U of S next year through tuition. <laughs> ah, right on. <laughs> Thank you. And we're also happy to say that we've had some of our Get a Bigger Wagon winners are now in Edwards. So our little goal was to feed the system. Still waiting for the commission check. <laughs> but, Cindy. all right. Yeah, Cindy too. She's, she's working cross-purpose here. So the <laughs> final group is $1,500 award for sailing the entrepreneurship and that's for anybody in the community uh, in Saskatchewan that promotes entrepreneurship and the winner of this year of course is the Saskatchewan Business Teachers Association and the captain of the ship is Cindy Lowe. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> <laughs> Just you two, yes. Thank you. It's usually a group of five of you. Yes. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the talker. She's the treasurer. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> she, funny you didn't bring your little <laughs> money machine, eh? These guys don't even know what a money counter is. You know, I used to own two of them. Yeah, they're a fun machine. Anyway, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 50, 1,000, 51, 52, 53, 54, 50, 55, 1,500. Right. So let's, girls, let's, let's go over here. <laughs> okay, after you, after you buy the beer, what, it, what else are you doing with this money? <laughs> uh, we actually planned the event for May last weekend in Regina at the Atlas Hotel, May 4th and 5th. We at just, uh, at we, the Atlas Hotel. Yeah, it'll be at the Atlas and then at the U of R on Friday. So May 4th, 5th, we just had a retreat. Ah, so we might fantastic. Have to that bill, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you wouldn't want to go in debt. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's another plaque, darling. 
Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, here we go. Just actually, we've got more treats than that. So this is the the business plaque. And that's that, that sailing the entrepreneurship. Looking there. And one more thing for Cindy because you are the captain. Now I'm not saying this is self-portrait, but it's just coincidence. She talks about money and finance, and the, this is from the one of our Get a Bigger Wagon books, original painting, and of course counting money. <laughs> Seems to be a theme here today. Uh, yes. So, anyways, we look over here, sweetie. All right. So, so remember, all the winners. So you have to say a thank you. Yeah. Before, don't anybody leave because we're going to get pictures of all the kids and the winners, okay? In a different location. In a different location. And did you want to say something? Sorry. what they usually do, just this oh. group. Yeah, I do have to thank Gordon Wayne for their leadership. We mentioned 16 years back when they started this. They spoke at our teacher conference last year and uh, blew the socks off of all our teachers there. They brought Lululemon to Saskatoon to Saskatchewan. I'm not sure if you knew that. They own the body shop. Somebody told me, are those the body shop people? I think it was uh, Mel that asked me about what you guys were roasting. So absolute leaders in entrepreneurship in our province. We're thrilled to have you here and mentoring all of us and especially the business teachers to, to give us a, a, a lesson in entrepreneurship too. So thank you both of you for your leadership. Yeah. And thank you, Cindy, for a great talk. I know you got a lot of people thinking about, I better start putting some money away. So thank you very much. So uh, that's it from us. We'll see you next year for the 17th. <laughs> but you got too much. And I've got a set of books for you. <laughs> Here's, I'm going to get you a new plaque. I, I had the indigenous kids at one. Oh, yeah. Okay.